Good morning. It's September the 27th, 2018. I'm Judge Pam Reeves, and I'm here today to do an interview of Ann Moss Stoller. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Will you start, please, by giving us your full name and your date of birth? I'm Ann Mostaller, and I was born March 15, 1941. Now, we'd like to start by having you tell us a little bit about your early years. Well, I grew up in the suburb of Pittsburgh, lived pretty much the same place most of the time that I was growing up. It was a, just a, one of those real pleasant, kind of safe communities where everybody went out and did what they wanted, and their parents didn't worry about them. and. Uh, just well, like Leave It to Beaver. It was kind of a Leave It to Beaver area, yes. It probably relatively conservative politically, very restricted in that I know for a fact who the one Catholic family was because the kids know stuff like that. And of course we had no Jewish people and the black people lived under the bridge. But other than that, all was well. Typical 40. Uh, yes, and 50s, 40s. Those things didn't change during that time. So what did your parents do? My mother w stayed home. She was a homemaker, and my dad was an engineer with a, it was called Graveau Corporation, just a company that did engineering work. Were there ever any lawyers in your family? No. Mm -mm. So Not that I know of, no. So where did you go to high school? It was a, a small high school called Avonworth High School. Um, had a very high percentage of folks who went on to college and of course later on it merged because that's what was supposed to happen you weren't supposed to have real small schools so it merged and it's entirely different now probably one of the most important things about that high school is that their mascot was an antelope <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't hear that very no often. you don't well no you said a large percentage of people went on to college, did that include the women as well? Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. that's a little unusual for that time. It would have been um, a, about 50 percent at least that went to college and they went all over. My husband went to Harvard as did another student. I mean we were classes of like 70 or 80 people so a couple went to Harvard, a few went to Brown. That's, it was that type of a, of a neighborhood. So tell me about going to college. Where did you end up going? Well I went to Brown. And what made you pick Brown? You know, I thought about that, and I don't quite remember, except I know that I also applied to Rutgers, which had a women's college called Douglas at that time. Brown had a women's college called Pembroke. And I must have thought that seemed like a good way to do things. I, I don't know. It was also the hardest school to get into that I applied to, so I suppose that's why I went. Well, now, I remember you told me a little bit about a situation when your dad went with you to visit college. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, I don't know what made him have these thoughts, but we had a really nice dean. She was very feminine. She was very pleasant. And we were chatting. And he said, now, what is she, meaning me, going to do with this education when she gets out? And of course, this is 1959, so women were expected to go to college, but to find a husband. That, that was the goal, and that was clearly not his idea of a goal. That's interesting. Well, while you were in college, you were there late 50s, early 60s. Right. That was definitely a time of a lot of change in our country. Talk to us about what it was like to be a college the, student. Then. There was no change there. Really? And that, in fact, as we've gone back and had alumni programs and talked to folks, um, they've said that Brown remained remarkably conservative, probably for a year or two after I left. And then it, you know, then it really became not conservative. But we had um, two black women in our class one of them was elected our class president. I think she graduated with us. I can't remember. The other one um, was in classes with me a lot. I don't think we felt like there was any problem <clears throat> with, with having black people in our class, but there were just so few. Now there's tons. I mean, right. they're, they're like half of the, half of the uh, class. Um, and that young woman was active, and I knew she was, but it never really 
registered with me that maybe I should go and sit in in a restaurant in Providence. I, I don't think that ever was a thought in my mind, mm -hmm. but I knew she did that. So then your undergraduate degree was in what? International relations. And what made you choose that? I don't know. Um, it was a little bit challenging, and I guess I thought that seemed interesting. Political science was relatively easy, so you had that, and then economics and history were a little bit tougher. But having them together was fine. And this, this uh, young woman who was black was in that same major, so I was with her a lot, and she ended up moving to Africa and living there. Oh, She's, really? She lives there as her resident. Mm -hmm. Well, now, were you married when you were in college? No, no. That's mm -hmm. what I thought. So when did you get married? Right after college. And how long that had summer. you known Mark? Well, uh, for a very long time, but we hadn't dated until we were in college. His family bought a house that was catty corner to my house in the community where I live. So the families knew each other more than maybe Mark and I did. They, they went to church together, they did things with each other, and after his father died, there was really a lot of interaction between our two families. So I think I, he moved to our area when he was, oh, maybe third or fourth grade, I think. So I knew who he was from that time on. And where did he go to college? Harvard. And what was his degree in? Hmm. Oh, um, his PhD was in enge engineering and applied physics. His undergraduate degree might have been physics, I'm not sure. So he was a doctor, my scholar. Yes, the PhD right. kind of doctor. Mm -hmm. So from... Uh, Brown and Harvard, you all got married, and you had children fairly quickly. No. Okay. No, uh-uh. Um, he was in graduate school. He did his undergraduate and his graduate work at Harvard. So we lived in Cambridge from, for about four years. And did, um, Katie was born just as we were leaving there. I worked at the Center for International Affairs while we were there for people like Morton Halpern and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Well, those are not household names at all. No. And, uh, it was very interesting work. I was a secretary who was allowed to do research. You've got to think back. This was a different time. Right. So that's what I did. Well, then at some point you all moved to Boca Raton. We did. That was the uh, postdoc position that you often, I think, did after graduate school. And what did you do when you were in Florida? Well, then I had a second child. I, was, I stayed home during that time. And your second child was a son? Mm-hmm, okay. Quentin. What are they doing now? Katie works for me as a paralegal, and Quentin um, is an actuary in Atlanta. So what brought the Moss Dollar family to Oak Ridge? Well, the lab. All right, now. Some people might not understand about the lab. Well, give us a little back Mark was given a position, a two-year position, um, at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and then he never left. All right. He was in what was called the Solid State Division. We probably can't talk about that too much because <laughs> I never did know what he really did. I, he would talk to me about particles and things being on the side of a glass and how they held on and. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> those were not meaningful discussions. So what did you do when you all came here? I know you were raising two kids. Right. You, and for a couple of point in your life where you started getting more involved in political issues? No, no, I don't think so. Um, we were here for maybe two years before I went to law school. So it wasn't a long time and the kids were really little. Um, I did some regular stuff. I learned to play tennis. I made draperies. Um, and after a couple of years, I realized I was keeping the house too clean. It was too, you know, just, and the youngest, younger child turned three. So I thought they could go to daycare. All right. And at that point, you enrolled at the University of Tennessee? I did. Tell us about your law school experience. Well, um, law school was okay. 
that was probably the hardest time of my life. That was really, really tiring. I remember being exhausted for three years, just absolutely flat out exhausted. You probably remember it too. I um, think that happens to people even when they don't have children. So. Well, it, it just, number one, I didn't think it was very interesting in the way it was taught. We were on the quarter system, so you would start, you might take a mid term exam and then you took an exam. You never really had time to write a paper or think about anything very much. I thought it wasn't a very good way of learning. Um, I remember when I graduated I was quoted and Dean Penniger was there and somehow he heard about it that I thought it was a trade school and I really did feel like it was a trade school and I still to some extent think that but it's a trade that's okay to learn. You know we learn civil procedure. It's not exciting. No. <laughs> Evidence, maybe a little more exciting, but not real exciting. And those are the things you absolutely have to know in your trade. So I don't guess I took a whole lot of con law and stuff that's kind of a little more exciting, but I, that, that was my view of law school. Tell us what it was like being a woman in law school at that time. Well, it was just a hoot. I, I mean, <laughs> that nobody ever called on us. Now, once in a while, somebody would call on Marty Black because she, she was, was likely to know. But they, I guess they didn't want to embarrass us, but you knew, you didn't, if you had time to prepare, that was good. But if you didn't, you wouldn't be embarrassed because you were sort of not there. Um, there were very few, just so few women. I was um, just going to ask if you knew how many women there were. There were around 20 out of 700 students when I started. And it didn't change a whole lot till the year we left. When we left in 74, I guess the incoming class of 74 had a third women. It was, it was a total remarkable change. And the women who, who were with me were odd. They weren't college graduates going to law school. I was eight years out of school, but I was more normal, really. Um, my person who was my partner was 45 years old. She had a home ec degree because they really didn't give engineering degrees back when she was in school. Agnes McCamus was retired Navy. Wow. And um, oh, I'm not thinking, but the, a woman from Maryville, Bird, um, I can't think of her I first name. Know you were talking about. She was married to Frank Bird, but she had, I believe, served in the legislature and taught political science at, I think, Maryville College. So, you know, we just weren't, and then these new ones who were coming in were much more in the regular path to become an attorney. So we were an interesting group. Quite I'd a say, bit older than your peers, I suspect. Um, the, the one saving grace for us was that a number of the male students had been in, in service, and so they were coming back later. So they were a little bit older. They weren't all 22 years old. And you had made a comment earlier about the professors seeming so young. Well, they were younger than we were. And Certainly you younger than Dorothy, and a lot of them younger than me. I was 30. Um, it, it was just kind of odd to be taught by these youngsters. And I don't think there were any female professors at the I certainly there. can't think of any. I, I've got to hope there was one tucked away in the library somewhere, but I, I think there was not. I think the first one was probably Professor Black, Marie. I think Marie that's Black. right, and I think we knew that at the time, that she had been accepted to be, but she, she, I'm not sure, was she a full-time professor or just taught some classes? I'm not sure either. She certainly was intimidating when I started. So. <laughs> oh, so she was teaching when you were in yes. school? When I started in 76, she, she was already teaching. She, she had a hard time going through law school personally. She had a child, you know, she had a lot of those same challenges, but she clearly grasped concepts better than the rest of us did. It, it, was, um, it was interesting to be in class with her because you're struggling to understand what the professor's wanting to talk about, and somehow she 
she had put it together, and you knew she didn't have any more time to study than, than anybody else. So while you were in law school, I think you became involved in helping to start the Law Women. We did. Mm -hmm. What led you to do that? I don't remember that either. And I've tried to think about what we did, um, but we had a big program. And I think there must have been a governmental group that was operating under Title IX because we put on a program at the student center across the way, the one that's been replaced, and people came from all over to learn about women's rights and, and the law. It was a big deal. Was this during the time that the Equal Rights Amendment was being um, yes, it would have been. Would have mm -hmm. been the time it, mm -hmm. it was in the ratification mm -hmm. process. In fact, I took a, a quarter off and worked in Nashville. You could do that then for the legislature. Grayford Gray was in charge of that program. And I heard them debating. We, we, couldn't, we weren't in the room, but I could hear them. I don't remember quite where I was. And the most amazingly foolish debates that <laughs> I have ever heard in my life about women would be um, out on the battlefield bleeding from having their periods and what would we all do about that. I, I, it was just outrageously foolish. Imagine that. I'd like to think things have changed. I was recently at an event where Justice Ginsburg was speaking and somebody asked her if she thought we still needed the Equal Rights Amendment. I assume she said yes. Yes, <laughs> very clearly. Well, now tell me what the job market was like for young women getting out of law school in 1974. We, I know I applied. Whether Dorothy, um, Why Dorothy, don't you first tell us who Dorothy is. Dorothy was Stahlberg was a woman who lived in Oak Ridge and um, apparently had wanted to go to law school but just hadn't done it yet. And so she came a little after I did but graduated with me and then we ended up having a practice together. I wrote letters to local folks and got no response, but one lawyer, I, I think from Campbell County, called and she said, well, what would you do here? So um, we worked for the summer after we graduated while we were studying for the bar. We worked for the legal clinic because it was a big deal then. They're, they did hire right. people. Um, and then we just decided there wasn't anywhere else for us to go, so we opened our office. I don't recommend doing that, and you shouldn't have to start that way today, but that's what we did. Did you have someone you could look to for advice, someone you could look to for did. question? We did. We had two men who were really very good with us. One was the public defender and became a general sessions court judge. And the other was a man named Mike Lane, who was just kind of a loosey-goosey, everybody's okay type of a person. And they could look at us and we were no different than any other lawyers. I think they're the only two. The men were very uncomfortable with us. And was there uh, a local bar that was supportive at all? We helped the bar because the bar, we have a really not very active bar in Anderson County. But at that time, they decided they would have a program to help people get divorces on a sliding scale fee arrangement. And we said we would do that, and we did. And that was kind of a way that we learned and, and got started. And we did that through the Bar Association. And what other types of uh, law did you practice? What areas? At the, at the, in the early years? Yes. We did... Um, a, a number of employment discrimination cases, uh, gender-based employment discrimination, we were the public defender for a year, Dorothy and I. It was before th there was the actual statewide, right. but it was funded by the state to have these little local public defender offices. So that was real good experience. And that was probably in the mid-70s for a year. How were you treated by the judges? I don't think there was much, I don't recall having a problem with the judges. Now maybe I just didn't see it, but I did think that they, for one thing, 
we started to practice and a new chancellor came in in Anderson County and a new judge came on the bench in Anderson County. They had just been made their own district, so the roving folks weren't roving anymore. Well, that's good. So we kind of started with um, folks who were just, just getting going and maybe that helped, I don't know. But I feel like I had a good relationship with the folks who were on the bench and have had since then. Was there ever a time that you really felt somebody was demeaning you or mistreating you because you were a female lawyer? Probably, I don't, I don't really think so. It, it would be more in the kind of, they could say sort of funny things. Um, maybe just being too helpful or you know, just not being just a regular person there. But I didn't, I don't feel like there was a lot of um, different type of treatment. Well, that was probably uh, a lucky circumstance. I, I think it might have been. Uh, I'm not sure. One, one of the things I don't quite remember, do you re maybe you don't remember, but Judge Child was still on the bench right. uh, doing the uh, divorces. Domestic relations. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot of that work. And I have a recollection that women were allowed to wear pants sometime right after we, we were licensed. In other words, I believe there was a time when we couldn't in his court, but I don't think that affected me. I think we were allowed to dress how we wished. Well, now, talk to me about... Um the areas of law that you came to focus in that you really enjoyed practicing in? Well, earlier I did a lot of domestic relations, criminal, and some title type work, you know, and did wills and, and probate. I've, I've always done that. Um, at some point, the rules of criminal procedure were revised, I think around 1980, and I decided I don't want to learn those new rules. So I gave that up. And then um, I think around that time also, Dorothy had been dabbling in some bankruptcy work and it was clearly not a good fit for her. So I started dabbling in it myself and, and kind of learning about that. And then Judith Whitfield joined our firm in the mid 90s, I think, and she did only family law. And at that point I was very glad to stop doing Pass family that along. law. Yes, I think you only do that for a certain <laughs> period of time and it shouldn't be 100% of your practice. It's, that's a stressful area. The domestic relations and the employment discrimination cases to me are really tough and you need to be a very strong person to deal with the emotional parts of those types of law. So then I just did more bankruptcy work and I, um, I think in 88 I was appointed as a bankruptcy trustee. And what exactly does that mean? Well, the trustee is appointed to oversee the cases and see if there are assets that can be pulled in to help pay some debts. Again, I started with a new slate because around 1988 they switched from the bankruptcy judge having certain responsibilities where he and the clerk's office appointed the trustees. They had a person who came and ran the creditors meetings and around that time the U.S. trustees office was formed in the Justice Department and they took over the administrative side and the bankruptcy judge became a real judge. So um, Judge Stair and I kind of started together. You seem to have some good timing here. I know, that's <laughs> funny, isn't it? Just start it off with new folks, and, that, and that, that was interesting, and that's what I've done since then. De debtor bankruptcy work, bankruptcy trustee work, and, and then the wills and probate. Now, um, in the late 70s, not terribly long after you got out of law school, you became involved in one of the first cases filed in the district under Title IX. This was the women's basketball case. Can you tell us a little bit about that case? You know, it is, we think of that as being 
a case that we know about and so on that, that had to do with Title IX. I believe that Judge Taylor had ruled earlier on the right of a girl to play at either baseball or football in Morgan County. And we never hear about that. Mm -hmm. But I believe he had done that. You know, he was a big sports guy. He was. So sports was real important to him, even though he was, what, four foot eight or something. <laughs> Very tiny. Um, so, uh, yes, a, a gentleman named Jim Cape, who was himself about six foot eight, came to uh, somebody I knew from Oak Ridge anyway. We played tennis. Um, and he wanted to have the rules changed in Tennessee so that his daughter could play full court basketball. Now when you say the rules change, what exactly were women doing at that time? As I understand it in Tennessee, there, there are different things that were done with women over the years. So I've been told that one time they had three court basketball right. and I never saw that. And I don't know what they wore to play that. And I don't know what they did in the middle court. I don't know what they did. And then there was the half court where you didn't cross the middle line, but you maybe had a rover, because I believe Pat Summit was a rover. So I gather that, I never played that. I played just the half court myself. And that's what was being played, as I understand it, in Tennessee under the TSSAA in 1976. And when people played half court, one side was offense and one side was That's defense. right. If you were a guard, you didn't cross the middle line. You tried to take the ball away from the forwards that were on your side. Now, when I played, we could only dribble twice. But I don't think that was a rule here. I think they could dribble. Well, you had been practicing for a very short amount of time when you became involved in this case. Was it your first case in federal court, or had you done some? No, work? we had done some. Um, we actually helped an, another attorney do a, uh, an employment discrimination case before we were licensed, and they allowed us to come in with that other attorney. Um, and we may have had another case. We, we did a fair amount in front of Judge Taylor. Dorothy did more than I did. He was, I, I think he was much more patient with us than he was with other attorneys. Much, much more patient, because we know he was not a patient judge. <laughs> he was not. No. Now, he did say a funny thing. I remember when we were sworn in, in in federal court, we were in a big line, and there were Dorothy and me, we were the women. Um, and he said to us, now, how do I address you, young ladies? And we're kind of like, oh, my, what on earth is this about? But he, he, was, he was okay. And of course, he was really interested in this basketball case. And I think looking at the record on that case, it moved so much quicker than anything like that would move today. Uh, it must have been a challenge just trying to keep up with all the moving parts. I don't remember that being a big challenge, which is funny when I look back at it. Uh, I think we were totally unprepared um, but it went okay. That's kind of a lucky thing when you have that happen, because I would never want to try a case that quickly and that way today without talking to all the witnesses and doing depositions and everything. And I don't, I don't think we did that. I think what, thinking back a little, I think we must have asked for a temporary injunction, and I bet he turned that down and said, instead of that, we're going to try the case next Wednesday or something mm -hmm. like that. Which would not be uncommon with him. Uh, sort of wouldn't be. That's right. Well, so what ultimately happened in the case? Do you remember? Well, for some reason, he ruled f for our, our client. And, of course, we were all very thrilled. But that, n I can't remember the timing, but the, it didn't change the rules right then. I don't know if the TSSAA applied for a stay. I don't remember what happened, but it was ultimately overturned by the Sixth Circuit. We did go up and argue that case. Um, and Judge Taylor was not a happy camper that we didn't appeal that on to the Supreme Court. But Vicki had dropped off the basketball team. <laughs> hard to appeal when your plaintiff is so, not playing basketball. I mean, we were, we were working on the appeal. We had hired somebody to come in and start getting that together and learning what all was involved. And 
all the special printing stuff that you have to do. But both Dorothy and I were admitted to the Supreme Court. We could have we could have gone on, but we couldn't. <laughs> um, what happened uh, in terms of your uh, calling Pat Summit as a witness in this case? You know, she wasn't famous then. Right. She so, had only been at UT for right, a year Right, right. Um, she, was, she was a great witness, you know, because when you think about it, Tennessee had a decent program in the state with that half-court ball. The state of Iowa was the state with a really good basketball program, and they played half court. So she came and testified that uh, women wouldn't be getting scholarships if they came from schools that played the half court. She was only going to be recruiting from schools outside of the state that played full court. So she was a great witness, but she wasn't. I mean, I didn't think of that as, of her as being an intimidating person that I wouldn't that, that I had to make real special arrangements to visit like you would would have later in her career. Right. She hadn't developed the stare yet. If she did, it didn't come across in, in this proceeding. Uh, maybe she stared at the other attorney that way. I really don't recall that happening. So did this cause you to be interested in women's basketball over the years? Is that something you I followed? I didn't. I didn't. I, had, I haven't particularly followed it. I have, you know, some. But Dorothy and another woman who was a good friend of hers, who worked for us for a period of time, they went on and brought actions under Title IX about different things in the Oak Ridge High School program where they thought that there was an equal emphasis on girls' activities compared to boys. They didn't go to court. But they did continue on, and they were great. Through the administrative Yes, side of they were great Lady Ball fans. In fact, Dorothy's husband, who is probably pushing 95 now, still goes regularly to all the games. Yeah. There are a lot of Lady Ball fans still in East Tennessee mm -hmm. as a result of Pat. And That's right. All the things she did over the years. Mm -hmm. So how many years now have you been practicing law? Well, we had a... 40-year party a couple years ago, so <laughs> there's math there. That uh, Are you interested at all in retiring? Are you well, you know, I have cut back some. Um, I don't do debtor bankruptcy work now. I just do the trustee work and the wills and the probate, and that's fine. That work is done with a fairly decent level of paralegal assistance, so I think I can do that. Uh, if I need to go on a vacation, I feel pretty comfortable doing that. There are other people in the office who can handle what needs to be handled. Well, you've certainly had a long and successful legal career. I think it has been. I, I've thought about that over the years. You know, you're driving down the highway thinking, now, what questions am I going to ask this witness today? Have I really prepared? Oh, goodness, I forgot the most important thing. You know, you always have that feeling. But then I, I think this, this really is an interesting career. It's not the same day to day. You're kind of in charge of yourself. You can do as well or not well as, as, as you want, put in the time or not. And I, I think it's a, a good career. It bothers me that I still don't see as many women as I would like to see when I'm in court. I don't know where they are because they're in law school and then where do they go and maybe they're more comfortable working like for government instead of working in the courtroom but they could be there it would be all right I don't see them that often in my courtroom mm -hmm. and it is a very mm -hmm. distressing mm -hmm. uh, question what happened to them after they where they go from law right mm -hmm. so would you recommend the legal career to you absolutely I absolutely and you know I don't think it I don't recommend doing it when you have a three and a four year old child necessarily, but if that's the only way you can do it, I guess that's okay. Well, you survived. Barely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And your children thrive? They're fine. I think in spite of me, they're fine. I, yes. One, one, my son can do a little stand up routine about. He said he was in daycare till he was 21, so <laughs> he does have a little feeling about that. 
Well, my daughter uh, started naming her stuffed animal trial again when she was very young, which <laughs> I think is her passive-aggressive mm -hmm. uh -huh. way right, right. of making me feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, have you given any thought at all to how you would like to be remembered in the legal world? Well, I mean, I, I, nothing special, I think, um, but I do feel like we, we set a good example. We were responsible. Um, I think we cared for our clients. I think we still are. And I, I think that's probably the best thing that you can say about attorneys. Well, thank you very much for sharing your time and your story with us You're today. very welcome.